Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Back in 2001, flooding caused the Halil River in southern Iran to overflow its banks and erode the surrounding lands. Layers of ancient sediment were washed away and what was uncovered were the remains of an ancient unknown cemetery. Before archaeologists were alerted to the site, locals and looters moved in, causing artefacts to appear on the black market, artefacts that relate to an undocumented Bronze Age culture dating back to 5,000, possibly 7,000 years ago. Before the police found the source of the incredible artefacts, thousands of graves were looted, and the site was also greatly damaged but archaeologists from around the world set out to document the discovery, joining an Iranian team to record and protect as much of the exposed site as possible, as well as excavate more potential sites nearby. Excavations began in February 2003 as Iranian archaeologist Yusef Majidzadeh identified the main necropolis and led the excavation. A mile to the west, an archaeologist also identified two large artificial mounds that rose above the plain. Inside the mounds were the remains of two major architectural complexes. The northern mound, known as Konar Sandal North, contained a court building, whilst Konar Sandal South contained a fortified citadel. Smaller buildings were also found under metres of sediment at the base of the mounds. Both mounds once formed part of a unified urban settlement that has been found to stretch many miles across the plateau. The civilization is known today as the Giroft Civilization, named after the modern local place name, and although there was much dispute between archaeologists over the age of the site, mainly because of the amount of looting, which made it hard to assess the age and authenticity of many of the finds, it was concluded that the Giroft site was first established around the end of the 5th millennium BC, but became a major urban centre during the 3rd millennium BC. The centre of the civilization was the Halil River, where monumental architecture, sizeable craft production areas, domestic quarters and cemeteries dominated the landscape. There were very distinct artefacts discovered, some practical, some decorative and others more sacred, with semi-precious stones like lapis lazuli, chlorite, calcite and obsidian. It is thought they had close links to the main Mesopotamian cities of the day, Mesopotamia being the land situated between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The citadel that occupied the southern mound was surrounded by a monumental brick wall, and radiocarbon dating places its construction between 2500 and 2200 BC. As you can see from the pictures, their artwork is exquisite, complex, beautiful and intricate. There are hundreds of vessels skillfully made and decorated, and are similar in style to the Mesopotamian tradition. As stated in a recent National Geographic article, the scorpion images found at Giroft echo the scorpion men depicted in the royal necropolis of Yore, which dates to the mid-3rd millennium BC. The bull men of Giroft are like the bullman Enkidu from the Akkadian Epic of Gilgamesh. Because of the cultural similarities, it is thought that the Giroff civilization and those of Mesopotamia all share a common heritage. We find recurrent and distinctive images of an inverted bull with an eagle hovering above it, and motifs that show eagles and snakes in battle remind experts of the famous Mesopotamian myth of Itana, the mythical shepherd king of Kish who is said to have been the first king after the flood. As you may or may not know, the myth says that Itana needed a way to ascend to heaven to attain a magic plant that will allow his wife to give birth to an heir. Meanwhile, an eagle and a serpent struggle. Once sworn allies, they become mortal enemies after the eagle eats the snake's offspring. The snake wreaks revenge on the eagle, leaving him to die in a pit. On the advice of the sun god Shamash, Itana saves the eagle, and in gratitude, the bird bears Itana up to heaven to retrieve the plant he needs to ensure his succession. 
That is very convoluted, but the story is interesting. And the symbolism seems to imply that the eagle is the sun, which dominates the heavens in the daylight hours. And the serpent could possibly be the Milky Way, the band of stars that streaks across the sky and therefore is symbolic of the night sky. The story may well be related to the sun's death and rebirth each day, similar to what we see in the myths of ancient Egypt like the death and rebirth of Ra Harakti, where the sun god travels through the caverns of the underworld, similar to the pit of the Mesopotamian story. In this image, we see the falcon-headed god Sokar Osiris, wrapped as a mummy in a stepped primeval pyramid-like mound, symbolising the womb of creation. It's showing us the sun is dead and awaiting rebirth. Yes, funnily enough, the Egyptians associated pyramids with death and rebirth. Sokar is associated with the deceased achieving rebirth in the underworld, under the light of the midnight sun. Above the pyramid mound, we can see a large snake, possibly depicting either the firmament or Milky Way. And above the snake, the dead king is depicted as Osiris, being greeted by the sun god Horus, indicating he, like the sun, is rising. In the Mesopotamian myth, we have a bird god that is left to die in a pit, as the snake dominates it, which in many ways is similar to this image and could be representing the same thing. But in the Mesopotamian myth, it is Etana that raises the eagle up. In the Egyptian underworld myths, the falcon-headed Sokar, who occupies a cave or cavern in the land called Rostau, is strongly associated with snakes, as well as a double sphinx acre lion. The oval is Sokar's cave, just like the Mesopotamian pit, and it becomes illuminated by the eyes of the heads of the great serpent god. The falcon-headed Sokar takes the wings of this life-giving triple-headed serpent, which is meant to symbolise the sun becoming rejuvenated on its journey to rebirth. Associated hieroglyphs say, Land of Sokar, Acre guarding the mysterious flesh. The mysterious flesh being the body of Sokar Osiris, aka the sun god in its death posture. The cult of Sokar and the myths associated with death and rebirth were prominent right across the Memphite region since the earliest times of dynastic history, and it's no surprise that this landscape became dominated by pyramid rebirth mounds and also a huge acre lion-like statue on the Giza necropolis, because Giza was actually once named Rostau, the name of Sokar's underworld. Furthermore, a life-size Old Kingdom lion statue was found directly outside the Great Pyramid in excavations in the 1930s. Lions do have a strong importance with the necropolis in the Memphite region, and that's because of the region's history with the Sokar funerary myths. That's why a Sphinx lion statue in the land of Rostau, a lion statue outside the Great Pyramid, and also big cat mummies are not out of place in the Memphite royal necropolis of Giza and Saqqara. Back to the Iranian site of Jeroft, and aside from this eagle and snake sun god rebirth myth, we also find representations of a universal flood. And, as we know, the Flood was a central myth or legend in Sumerian and Babylonian scripture, as well as many other cultures around the world including Egypt. Whether the Flood myths refer to a more localised yet still large-scale Flood event that took place in the Middle East, something that we know did happen in prehistory, or a worldwide Flood event, or whether it's purely symbolic is open to debate. But the fact we find the same myths at Jeroft is interesting. This is an example of their writing that was found on a baked clay tablet, and together with two more tablets, experts know that this civilization had at least two different systems of writing, one being similar to the Elamite, a script that was used in the Kingdom of Elam on the border of Mesopotamia, and the other, shown here, has a very geometric form and had not been seen until the excavations. One thing is for certain, Giroft was literate, and although this is a very tentative comparison, I can't help but notice a slight similarity between the geometric script from Giroft and this strange writing that is found on the outside of the Great Pyramid of Egypt. Maybe there is a common source. I don't know.
But how could such an incredible city be unknown for so long? Why were there no records in ancient Mesopotamia or even Egyptian writings? Especially because it did share such clear and obvious cultural links. Well, Yusef Majidzadeh does believe he solved the puzzle, and believes that these are the remains of the city of Arata, a land that was praised for its wealth in numerous Sumerian poems. One ancient text talks of it having a conflict with the powerful Mesopotamian city of Uruk. Arata was described as having battlements of green lapis lazuli, its walls and towering brickwork are bright red, and their brick clay is made of tin stone that is dug out of the mountains. Geographically, mountains do surround the site, there was an abundance of semi-precious stones, and the civilization clearly had some wealth. There is a lack of solid evidence, but the interpretation is certainly on the table, although Arata is thought by many to be merely a Bronze Age myth and not a geographical location. Others say it's the Kingdom of Mohassi, described by the kings of Akkad during their glorious fights against a powerful state in the Iranian highlands. It is written that King Rimush of Akkad defeated King Abal Gamash of Mohassi in battle. When he conquered Elam and Mohassi, he took 30 gold mines, 3,600 silver mines and 300 slaves. Akkad did exist between 2350 and 2200 BC, so it was contemporary with the site that is being excavated in Iran. Like all ancient sites, this of course is all a work in progress, and it is incredible to think that a well-established lost civilization was only discovered 20 years ago. Mesopotamia is always called the cradle of civilization, but as the article says on National Geographic, the findings at Giroft may demand a reassessment of that interpretation, especially with just how sophisticated it was, and some believe it dates back to very early times. I have long thought the Nakeda culture of Upper Egypt, the ones who went on to conquer the cultures of Lower Egypt in the north, build pyramids and transform what was likely an earlier mound or structure into a sphinx lion, were strongly influenced by Mesopotamia, whether through trade or through settlement. The posture and style of the Great Sphinx is very similar to both the Nakeda and Middle and Near Eastern styles of lions and dog statues. In pre-dynastic times, the settlement of the Egyptian Nile Valley was gradual, as the African humid period came to an end with the onset of desertification, with people entering the Nile Valley from northern Africa, as well as Ethiopia and the Near and Middle East. We know this from comparing genetic studies, from climate data and settlement data. I have a full detailed video on the climatology and the history and height of the Nile River all the way through the pre-dynastic and dynastic eras coming soon. Together with the native people of Egypt, it seems that during these formative years, the Nile Valley was very much a multicultural landscape, a place where ideas, practices and techniques would have certainly been shared and mixed. The pre-dynastic Nakeda culture that emerged in the south of Egypt are those responsible for the gods like Horus, Hathor, Set, Anubis and so on, as these gods and their religious iconography are seemingly absent in the artefacts and decoration of the north. As stated, it was the pre-dynastic Nakeda culture that went on to become the dynastic Egyptians, unifying the country under one king, a new religion and so on. The reason I mention this is because the Nakeda culture of the south would have had people from Africa and also the Middle East come together, the merging together of influences and ideas with the indigenous ones as well. And all these ideas came together to form the Nakeda culture, and then ultimately the dynastic era. Looking at the Giraffe civilization and Mesopotamian civilizations as well, I can't help but make tentative links between the cultures. Look at the eagle and the snakes, iconography that certainly reminds me of the Sokar Osiris, snakes and Ra Horus solar rebirth myths, and even the form and style of this eagle, with its red solar eye, reminds me of these ancient Egyptian depictions of Horus, with its wings outspread and the solar disc on its head. Horus was a sun god, as was Ra. 
both shown as falcon deities in Egypt, and often combined to become Ra Harakti, meaning Ra who is Horus of the Two Horizons. Horus is the older god though, originating in the pre-dynastic Nakeda culture. But I can't help but think that the religion mythology and the blueprint for the gods of ancient Egypt originated in Mesopotamia, and now also Iran, during the formative years of the Nakeda culture, and this is based on the strong cultural similarities. The bulk of the Egyptian gods, including Horus, seem to emerge during the second phase of the Nakeda culture, known as Nakeda II, the Nakeda being split into three developmental phases. The Nakeda II began sometime around 3500 BC, and it is at this time when we begin to see clear Mesopotamian influence in Nakeda culture, with the introduction of cylindrical seals and also a style of art and iconography that is very similar. Scorpions had great importance symbolically in Mesopotamia, the Jiroff civilization, and also Egypt. There was an Akeda King Scorpion in southern Egypt, a King Scorpion in Mesopotamia, and rich Scorpion iconography in the ancient city of Yor and the Jiroff site. Cattle gods and cults were also popular with the early Nakeda Egyptians, with Hathor and Bat having major prominence, and we've just seen the bull men of Jiroft, and we know of the bull man Enkidu from the Epic of Gilgamesh. These ornaments from Jiroft are decorated in a similar manner to the palace facade style that we find in both Egypt and Mesopotamia, and this section reminds me of the structure beneath the Sphinx as seen on the famous Dream Stealer, as well as these decorations on early dynastic and late pre-dynastic objects. Here we can see a pyramidal-like structure being excavated at Jiroft, identified as a ziggurat. And of course, we have pyramids in Egypt and ziggurats in Mesopotamia. Do they all have the same origin, but with a unique localization and evolution? Now look at the style of art on the Nakeda pre-dynastic cosmetic palettes of Egypt, and compare it to the style of art at Jiroft. I think there are similarities. In this video, I'm not saying that Mesopotamians or those from Jiroft conquered Egypt and imposed their culture in a forceful manner. But we do know that from genetic studies, in the pre-dynastic era, some people did come to the Nile Valley from the Near East and also the Middle East, as well as Northern Africa and Ethiopia. And the influx of people increased over time as the Nile River gradually receded in size. We also know there were strong trade links between Mesopotamia and the Nakeda culture. Ideas do get shared. I do think we can see clear parallels between various cultures, as well as practices and techniques, which leads me to believe that the dominant people at the heart of the Nakeda culture, those that went on to form the dynastic era, could well be of Mesopotamian or Iranian origin. An older culture that spread its wings quite literally across the land. Either that, or the ideas and beliefs were adopted by indigenous people. Of course, due to various other cultural influences from northern Africa and Ethiopia, as well as indigenous traditions, the Nakeda culture was unique compared to those of Mesopotamia and Iran. But I just think that at the very heart of all these cultures, with the myth of the dying and resurrecting bird sun gods, guardian lions, underworld snakes, bull cults and scorpion kings, there could well be a common source. And maybe that common source goes much further back in time. Maybe originating with some ancient oral tradition, and maybe there is evidence in cave art. I don't know. At Jiroft we have an eagle with a red solar eye, in Egypt we have Horus or Raharakti with a red solar disc on its head, and here is the vulture of Gebekli Tepe, wings outstretched and holding what some say is a solar disc. Maybe this is the oldest bird sun god of all, and maybe these people of ancient Anatolia that built Gebekli Tepe and carved incredible animal motifs are the source of the ancient Mesopotamian, Iranian and Egyptian religion, iconography and traditions that followed. I'll work more on this idea in the future. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.